that you can drill everything out, uh, all the posts out in a straight line uh, to a little bit larger size. Then you would go in with a reamer because a reamer will drill a, will uh, make a much straighter hole than, than, than a twist drill will and get a really nice uh, uh, even hole all the way through all those posts that's in a straight line. You can ream each and every key to that same size and then I, I keep drill rod which is uh, sold generally in three foot lengths from machinery suppliers in every drill bit size and I keep all the different sizes handy that are, are, are good for woodwind repair and I can make a new rod to fit uh, slightly bigger than the original and that will take up slop on, on, uh, on the keys so that they fit well and that way you can get the pads to seal well. I've got a piece of drill rod in here and I'm going to run a machinist's die over that to cut a screw thread on it to make a new rod. Say you have to make an oversized rod after reaming keys up to size so things fit well on a worn out instrument. I'm going to file a little uh, taper on the end of this uh, to help the die start. The die uh, is just a screw thread drilled through uh, a hole drilled and a screw thread put in it in, in a piece of hard steel and then little uh, holes around it to, to make cutting edges. And we're going to put it in a die stock which holds that, gives you a grip on it. And there's little screws on the die stock to hold it in place. And I just put it in there backwards. One side of the die has a tapered thread to help it start easier and the other side has full threads all the way to the end so that you can cut uh, a full thread all the way up to the end of where you're trying to put your screw threads. Machinery catalogs and some of our suppliers stock all this stuff. If you're going to get very deeply into repair you're going to need these things in the common sizes that uh, woodwind uh, instruments tend to be made in. Uh, sometimes they're inch, sometimes they're metric. You'll need to know a little bit about running machinery. There are books available on that. It's, it's a w much easier to learn how to, to do a lot of this stuff, basic machining stuff, than it is uh, to learn how to put in pads in an instrument or play the oboe. Uh, Smartflix.com, uh, smartflix.com has videos you can rent cheaply to watch how to run a lathe and a drill press and various uh, machinery. And uh, Lindsay Books, BKS.com, uh, Lindsay is L I N D S A Y, BKS.com has all sorts of old machining books and you'll want to be a little bit proficient at that. So we're going to put this on here. We're not going to run this under power. Uh, it needs a little bit of oil. And I'm going to push that on there hard, the die. I'm going to run it by hand. I'm being careful to hold the die stock square at right angles so I don't get what's called a drunken thread so that the thread is at right angles. When I got a good start the steel wants to make a long chip that kind of clogs up in there and it can uh, break, the rod can break off inside the die so you want to back it up and break that long chip by back going backwards so you turn it a turn or two and then back up a little bit and that's standard machinist procedure for cutting a small screw thread If I had reverse on this lathe, I could turn it on and run it in reverse to, get, to quickly get the uh, die off of there. Don't have as much of a thread cut on there as I thought. I've got a very good start though.
any good shop's going to have the equipment and, and the and the, uh, the all the dies and, and uh, drill rod they need for the instruments that they work on. This is pretty standard stuff in a big shop. I'll hold that up to the camera so you can see that. Now I want to talk about fitting keys that are held with two pivot screws, one on each end. You can uh, refit the key by how far the pivot screws go together. A pivot screw, generally they have a little head on them that, that stops inside the, uh, there's a little shoulder inside the post. And if you need the screw to go together a little bit, the screws to go together a little bit closer to hold the key a little more snugly, there are a set of reamers available from Faris Tools and Kraus Products and others that fit inside there and you can ream a little bit deeper uh, and take a little bit of metal out of there so that the head of the screw can go in a little bit deeper. You can also use a little bit of Teflon tape, just a small amount. And tuck that down inside the key and, and take up some of the play with some Teflon tape in, inside the, the end of the key there is another possibility. If things, uh, the, the pivot screws really need to go all the way in and snug down, that's when the screw threads tighten up. Otherwise it'll work loose if you have to leave it a little bit loose if say they go together too far and the key sticks. And then you, uh, you can buy little reamers that, that will uh, ream, ream out the key a little bit deeper so that the, the screw doesn't snug up quite so much in there. You can make up reamers by uh, fi filing a, a basically the shape of the pivot screw in, in, in a lathe just with a file. And then uh, filing half of that away so you've got this shape to it and you just file half of it away so you've got some sharp edges on it. And, and you can harden that up and you can study that in machinist books. Uh, you, you heat it red hot uh, with a torch and then dip it very quickly in, in a can of water and that will uh, harden the steel. And you may not even need to harden it depending on how, how hard the uh, key alloy is. Uh, but that's how you could make a reamer to, to uh, uh, ream out the ends of the key so that the screw doesn't, doesn't bind there. One time recently I had an oboe where even though I got the pivot screws snugged up in this direction on the ends of the keys, there was still a lot of lateral play because the holes in the end of keys were either worn or just drilled too big to begin with. So, so it would move around too much for the pad to seat. There's a soft silver solder. Uh, there's a high silver content and some tin. But it's fairly soft. You can bend it around. It melts at a, at a rather low temperature. You use a little bit of this acid uh, called flux that helps the, the solder to flow. The parts need to be very clean for solder to stick to it. So you, you heat the key up uh, just to about 400 degrees with this stuff, which is very easy to do with a small torch. And you put a little bit of the acid on there to clean the parts and then, then just Touch, uh, touch the hot part with a little bit of the solder. It fills up the uh, hole in the end of the key. Then you can drill a little bit under size and, and, and that will act as a good bearing surface if, the, uh, if that hole was too big for the pivot screw. Uh, you can fit the pivot screw. You can put it in the end and kind of tap it in place and the solder's soft enough that it will kind of take up the shape of the pivot screw. So that's another way you can take up a lot of gap in the ends of uh, these pivot screw uh, type keys. Now I want to talk about changing a spring. There are basically two types of springs on an oboe. There's the needle springs, which look like little needles. Uh, sometimes they come to a point like a needle. At one time they were actually made out of needles. Uh, they're, they're tempered to be a spring temper. You have uh, 
blue uh, blued steel uh, needle springs, and you also have uh, you you can buy stainless steel. There are probably a couple hundred different alloys of stainless steel. Uh, some are better than others. Uh, Lau Bonobo uses steel springs. Ed Krauss uh, sells uh, some stainless steel springs uh, th that are supposed to be quite good. Uh, generally, the, the stainless steel springs you generally see in the student instruments are not not really springy enough. You have to use a little bit bigger diameter uh, needle spring in, in those instruments in, in order to have uh, enough of a, a spring action. So those are going to be uh, a little bit larger diameter to do the same job. So when you change the springs, you're, you're going to want to stick with whatever's in there. So you'll want to stock both kinds of springs. The spring that breaks the most often uh, that I see is this G-sharp spring, and you got to pretty much take everything apart to get to it. This is just a junker oboe I have for, uh, for practice. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and change that. Generally, I will take some flat nose pliers and turn the post out. Usually, when you have to change that, the spring is actually broken off, sometimes very close to the post. And there are various pliers. If you can see this, one of these jaws is a little bit longer than the other and has a little arm on a little L shape to it to push on the spring. Uh, the other jaw is shorter so that you can put it on there and push out the spring without the spring hitting the other jaw. So we're gonna I'm gonna go ahead and cut this spring off. Rather stubby where they usually break. And if you have a little piece sticking out that you can can see, you probably can't see that in the video, so that you can reach it with these pliers, you might be able to get it out that way. And that came out. These pliers are good for, for taking, removing or, or replacing springs. They came from Ed Krause up in Portland, Oregon. You have to be a uh, licensed... Uh, repairman to, to, to order stuff from him. He's not a whole, uh, he doesn't wholesale to the public. You have to have a sales tax permit or some other proof that you're in this as a business. But he's got some of the best supplies. So sometimes it's quite difficult to get those out, especially if they're broken flush to the post, which they often are. I have a uh, little flute key assembly uh, set up. A uh, couple different people. This says Freeze on it, so I guess that's where I got it. It has some different attachments down here. That uh, This one has a little lead block on it, so you can put a post in, in there and kind of set it in, tap it into the lead. And you can set a post in there and line it up. It's got three different little mandrels for removing and, and putting in uh, little flute pins, which look like little springs that hold key assemblies together on flute. I have done quite a bit of flute repair in the past and you can line it up like that and then tap tap the spring out. It can be hard to tap in just the right spot. You can also set this in a, in a vise and use a needle spring uh, as a punch. I would grind a tiny flat on the end of the needle spring and hammer out the, uh, uh, punch out the uh, broken spring. That's another possibility. Sometimes if you punch in just a sl in the wrong spot, you can really mangle up the post to where it's kind of hard to see where the, where the spring is at that point. And sometimes I'll have to uh, look with a magnifier. I might have to file down, kind of clean up the area a bit and look with the magnifier and really make sure I'm punching in just the right spot. You really need to see what you're doing. Uh, to replace the springs, I've got a little uh, 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 caliper, a dial caliper. Uh, this is an electronic one. 
Uh, it measures in both inch and metric, and I'll, uh, that'll help you in choosing the replacement spring of the same size. In general, a thinner spring can be bent, flexed more, and will have more spring action than a heavier spring, which you may not be able to bend enough without it feeling too heavy. So don't, don't be in the habit of uh, replacing springs with something bigger than what uh, was in there. I have actually seen a Luray oboe that somebody uh, drilled out those little B flat and C springs on the top joint and put in uh, paper clips. Uh, if, if you run into something like that, you would have to either fill with silver solder or, or uh, solder in a little piece of, of brass rod or something and re-drill so you can get back down to size. It's easy to drill up and go to a bigger spring. It's not so easy to go back the other way. So that's the little flute uh, key assembly pin remover that's been real handy for some oboe springs that get stuck. You'll want some sort of pliers to cut, some wire cutting pliers to cut the springs to length. So here's the post and I've already lost the piece of spring that fit in there. But that spring's generally, uh, I know on a Ray oboe, I don't even know what this one is, so it's generally about 19 to 21 thousandths of an inch. I have a spring here that is 20 thousandths. We'll see if that fits. Some springs, especially the stainless steel ones, come with a little flat spot hammered on, on the end. Uh, it's going into a round hole, and a little flat spot on the end of the spring is the only thing that's holding it in snugly. I chose well. You want it to be a good sliding fit, but fairly snug. And then you probably can't see that, but this one has a flat spot on it, and it's sticking out because it doesn't fit in. And I can use these same spring pliers. You can expect to spend about uh, 40 or 50, maybe even $60 on a good set of spring pliers, and I have several different ones here. You press that in, make sure it's stuck good. You'll want to cut it to length. You'll want to measure carefully and cut off any, any extra. And then turn it back into the oboe. I still have this one quite a bit too long here. Still a little too long. This G sharp spring has to, um, mechanically, it has to hold, uh, it's a double spring action, it has to hold a weaker spring. It has to work against a weaker spring. So it's really a rather short spring for, for how heavy it needs to be. And there's that. The springs should have a nice curve to them, uh, preferably not a kink in one spot, but rather a, a nice curve. You can use round nose pliers to do that. And it should be bent in the direction that it has to pull the key. Uh, usually bent one way or the other and, and angled slightly upwards. I've got some other pliers. These are some... Uh, these better spring pliers work up. They open parallel rather than, than rather than like this. And this one has three little screws. You can arrange either one of these screws, take it out, and put it in this primary position, and that will act as a to help punch or push out a broken out piece of spring. And these came from Ed Krauss, and they're some of my favorite spring pliers. Again, you can expect to pay about $50, $60 for a nice set of pliers. This is the first set I had. They sort of work, uh, but they don't open in a parallel fashion. And they have a little screw here as a punch, and you can get replacement screws. It's not hardened like it should be. They, they tend to uh, wear and round out, and, and, and they don't act as a very good punch. 
um, but those are a little less expensive. I believe I got those from Freeze Tools. Then I have, uh, these are quite nice at times, these are whole spring removing pliers. It's got a rather wide set of jaws on it. Oftentimes when I'm doing crack repairs, uh, you can see how close some of these uh, uh, posts are. And I have to take a lot of posts out of the way to do the fill on a crack repair and to uh, do a little sanding to get it cosmetically looking good. And so you can't turn out this post because the spring would hit another post. So sometimes you have to take the whole spring bring out because you're going to want to save it and put it back in. And that gets them out rather easily. So those are good to have. And those weren't terribly expensive. I believe I got those from Faris Tools. You can get online and... and they have a website and you can see some of the tools that they have. Um, I'll show you a big uh, needle spring here. You can buy these in sets or you can buy the individual sizes. For oboe you're going to want probably between about eight thousandths of an inch uh, in diameter on up to about 32. This is a whole set that goes up to